Whew. All right, there we are. Got it working. I was having trouble getting the live feed started. So, welcome to my shop. It is Tuesday evening. This is episode 36 of Holster Life, part of the Back to Basics series. Tonight we're covering molding. I've had a kind of exciting week. I decided to finally get my act together and start trying to implement some lean stuff in my shop. Um, I stopped reading the book Lean for Dummies um, because I found it unhelpful. Uh, maybe if I ran a different kind of company or I was a different size or in a different situation than I am, it would be helpful. But I found it unhelpful. Um, on the flip side, I did watch some videos uh, on the web. I watched a little bit of Paul Akers, although I'm eh, on Paul Akers just because his vibe. Um, but I watched a machine shop tour where John Saunders from Saunders Machine Works went to Jay Pearson's shop, Pearson Work Holding. Hey, Austin Chippy, Formidable Force, Jim Ryan, Tough Tech is here. If you are a holster company, please post your company name in the comments, and I would very much appreciate it if you would like and share the feed, especially if you are a holster maker for the Back to Basics series. Hey, Dan Taylor, Commonwealth, and Ahmad. Hey, what's up? Well, I got your payment, so your molds are going to be starting soon, Ahmad. That's up. Hello, Corey. One of the employees from Squared Away. Booth, you're back from your call, or you weren't out, but welcome. Hey, Vern. So... Anytime I do the basics thing, um, part of my goal is providing, I'm going to sneeze, excuse me. <laughs> okay, springtime. Part of the goal is providing value that makes it possible for your businesses to grow by helping your employees learn things quickly. Hi, Jess. Hello, Seth. So on the topic of molding, could easily be a three-hour talk. And actually, somebody, I was talking on the phone today for, with uh, Tyson uh, from Lamb Tactical, and he said he's been watching all my videos and said, did you know you have almost 40 hours of live videos to watch? I'm like, well, I sort of knew that, but I don't go back and watch them all that much. So it hadn't occurred to me that I've almost got a 40-hour work week worth of live videos to watch. Hello, John. Hey, Tim Anderson. So I went ahead and did notes again tonight. So I got a whole bunch of notes of things to go over. I'm going to start with some basic definitions of terms because when holster makers talk about process, if they don't use the same terms or don't understand each other's terms, wires can get crossed and misunderstandings happen or problems don't get solved quickly. Hello, Aaron. Hi, Mike Holmes, 98 Tactical and Cascadia Codex in the house. I appreciate you guys being here. So some definitions of terms. The first one. Definition. I, I define definition as how closely or accurately the plastic conforms to the mold. Not necessarily to the shape of the final product that you're putting in it, but how closely the plastic conforms to the mold. And I would say 100% definition is total conformity of the plastic to the mold going down from there. 50% definition, you might see the shape, but it's not really clear, it's not crisp. Slack. When I talk to other holster makers about plastic, slack is a term I use a lot. And one of the most common places I end up talking about slack is in here in the sight channel. Because these corners are a place where holster makers get widely varying results. Hey, Jeff Brooks. Um, and if you have the plastic sort of dipping through there and you're not getting crisp molding in those corners, that slack or well, that lack of definition there is going to affect the way you can fold. So when I see guys having trouble with folding stuff that was molded on split molds, one of the first things I look for is how crisp is their sight channel? Do they have a consistent amount of material? Because if you just drape from this corner to this corner in a shallow arc, you have less physical kydex from corner to corner than if you come tight down here into the corner, flat across the bottom and back up. The total amount of material you have there can't change after you've molded and cooled the part. And so when you go to fold it, if your parts are inconsistent or there's not really enough material there, your folds will suffer. Hey, Andy from C&G Holsters, thank you for watching. Many say tenting. I define tenting differently, Mike, and I'll get to that in a second. Okay? Slack um, doesn't necessarily produce tenting, but they are related. Draft. This is another important term, especially in mold making. Hello, Justin Shirey. Draft in mold making is 
any slight angle or any, any angled or sloped surface on the mold. So on a mold, like this magazine carrier mold, okay, come on, show up. We have these vertical sides here on the outside edge of the mold, or, you know, let me just take this block of, oh, no, not showing up. Okay, this block of material. If this was my mold, if I have Kydex running across here and then down off the side, this is a vertical face, a true 90. It has no draft angle. If it had a 5 or a 10 degree draft angle, it would be leaning out slightly at the bottom, so the plastic would be going down a slope rather than a vertical wall. Where draft really comes into play is at corners and any place the shape is tall. Yeah, CNG holsters is rolling deep. I got on Chris Burns' case and said, all you guys need to watch the feed tonight. Hello, Todd May. Um, and so places you'll typically see tenting, that's the next term. Tenting is undesirable folding or bunching up of material, usually around a vertical contour or corner, any place where the plastic drops off an edge of the mold, but corners are especially prone to this. So a place where you'll often see tenting is up here at the corner, if you've got light bearing at the corner of the light or at the corner, the bottom corner of the slide at the dust cover, where you have plastic running along the underside of the dust cover, meeting plastic that's running along the face of the muzzle. Anytime you have that, you are going to end up with some extra material there. So let me take my handy andy membrane and fold it down over here. Okay, when these run off these two faces, you end up with extra material here at the corner. And this is one of the realities of molding. You can't make material go away. You can only shift it around into places where it's not going to be a problem for you. So one of my main goals, one of my top level principles when I'm designing molds or if I'm dealing with a mold that's producing tenting in a way that I don't want, is try to adjust the shape of the mold to shift the tenting into a waste area where it will be trimmed away and not fall inside the boundaries of the finished part. The easiest way to deal with tenting is shift it out and cut it off. That's my preferred way to deal with tenting. So anytime we're talking about molding, mold prep is the foundation of the entire process and the entire finished part. If you skimp on mold prep, you will end up with a subpar product because molding is a garbage in, garbage out process. If your mold is prepped incorrectly or is not prepped properly or carefully, you will end up producing, all, copying all those defects, all those omissions into the final part and then trying to solve them there. Hey, Don Carpia, I'm doing great. Thank you for watching. It has been a long day. I opened the shop at 8 and I have not left the shop, so it's... Uh, It's been a long day, getting a lot of stuff done, but long. The weather's been beautiful, had the doors and windows in the shop open today. It was sunny and warm, but not too hot. I was loving it. So when you're looking at a mold, if you're dealing with something like this, okay, if you're dealing with a cast replica, a blue gun, an orange gun, a multi-mold, a DIY drone, any non-split mold, um, generally on the mold, any high points or low points have to be resolved through prep. Um, my basic thing is bumps need channels. Anytime there's a protrusion, a bump, a lever, a latch, a button, anything that sticks up, you have to provide a channel for that to clear all the way out to the mouth of the holster. Okay? We fill in the low places and we channel the high spots. So ejection port, trigger guard, uh, any place where you have a low or an inside shape, you're going to fill it in or cover it over in order for the shape to move smoothly in and out of the holster without catching. So prep is king. No matter what your molding process is, if your prep is garbage, your final product will suffer. It is possible to have a beautifully prepped mold and end up with a bad product because your molding process has problems, but more often than not, when I see holsters that look bad, they've either, they either don't, they don't perform well, I handle them and they don't perform well, or I look at them and I can tell they won't perform well, it's typically because of prep issues, not so much molding issues. And almost nothing pains me more than seeing a beautifully defined, well-molded holster with a faulty mold prep that destroys the function of the final product. That's just like, you had one job, one job, and you didn't do it. So, uh, sharp corners and undercuts are also areas where you need to account for 
what's going to happen with the plastic when you mold it. Alex Wick says, do you think it would be a good business decision to only make mag carriers? Alex, I don't, but that's just my gut reaction because most people who buy mag carriers are buying mag carriers to go with a holster, and many holster purchasers, unfortunately, don't buy mag carriers. Hello, Jeremy Chastine. Thank you for stopping in. Um, so I don't know. I think most holster makers um, find that magazine carriers are a good cross-sell or a good upsell to package in with their gear. I don't know if you could have a viable business uh, only selling mag carriers. I'm just not sure. Hello, Chip Ream. So uh, if it doesn't fit well, this is just an aside. If you're, if you're working on something, you're actually making a product, you've molded something, and it doesn't fit well. You put your mag in, your knife in, your gun in, whatever it is you're holstering up, and it doesn't fit well. Shyworks LLC. Hello, Jesse. Uh, if the thing doesn't fit well and you haven't gone through the entire process of finishing it all out, I almost always recommend setting it aside and starting over. If you can tell when you finish the molding process that something has gone wrong or you look at the plastic and you realize you forgot to account for something in the mold and you have a problem, rather than pouring in more time and more time and more time to get all the way to the end, nearly to the finish line, only to stop and throw it away then, I would say cut your losses early, go back, properly prep the mold, and mold again because the amount of time you'll save by not wasting it finishing an unfinishable, unusable product more than offsets the little bit of material you'll eat by molding it a second time. Just checking in, going to watch in full later. This is Aaron Brass of BSD Holsters. Well, thank you for checking in. Um, please do share the feed on your way out the door, Aaron. Um, so blocking, another one to define. Blocking is any shape you add or any modification you make to the shape of the product or the mold in order to enable the plastic to fit and function better. So classic examples of blocking are filling in the trigger guard, blocking off the Picatinny rail so it doesn't snag, filling in the ejection port, which everybody should do all the time. Ejection ports should be fully filled in. Uh, if you're doing split molds, um, you know, your sight channel blocking, whatever you put in the middle to create that gap. So once you fold, you have passage for the sights. Uh, any blocking you have for clips, it can be round dots, it can be squares, whatever blocking you're using to attach struts or overhooks, loops, foamies, tackwear clips, anything, everything, any shape you're adding to the holster is blocking. Um, materials guys use for blocking. I've seen guys use everything from popsicle sticks to a water weld, sculpey, screws, metal washers, uh, dowels, brad nails and blocks of wood, pieces of HDPE, pieces of aluminum, pieces of steel, anything you can grind, bend, drill, cut into a shape you want is fair game for blocking. But not all blocking is created equal and you have to find a way to attach it to your mold. I prefer generally to mechanically attach my blocking. I generally prefer a combination of screws, pins, and or tape is what I typically prefer. Chris, you want a fantastic opportunity to like and share the feed. Don't miss it. Yeah, Aaron says paint sticks, also a popular option. Okay. What you want to avoid though when you're putting blocking on is you want to avoid having there be gaps, corners, uh, undercuts any place where the plastic can catch under the edge of the blocking. If that happens, when you go to pull the plastic off the mold, usually you'll tear the blocking off the mold as well. And it's very frustrating. If you're going to do careful mold prep, the method of attachment depends on the mold material. Yes, that's true, John. Some molds take very nicely to threaded fastening. Some don't and are brittle and split and crack. Some really like JB Weld, Water Weld, different kinds of putty or adhesives, and others don't. HDPE does great with screws, doesn't do so well with glues. Does okay with tape, but it depends. You'll have to figure out based on what you're using as a mold, what works best. Always share. Thanks again for the G43 mold. You're very welcome, Michael Fernandez. Thank you for coming back and watching again. So basically the sky's the limit when it comes to blocking materials. Almost anything you can get to work works. It's fair game. If, if it works, great. 
If you're going to take the time to prep the mold carefully, build in prep protection. Try to find ways to minimize snagging, dragging, catching, tearing, breaking loose when you actually go to demold the plastic. Because if you spent the time to carefully build up the prep on the mold, it's discouraging to have that blocking get ripped off on the first go round. Or if you're doing a batch, say you have to make 10 or 15 of something, if you have to reset the blocking every time, your consistency will suffer, which can produce problems when you get to the end of the line and are quality checking everything. I found aluminum heat tape works well with the HDPE molds. Vern, that is my preference. Anytime I'm working with an HDPE mold and I have to add blocking temporarily, aluminum heat vent tape is what I tend to use. Um, mold prep, assuming you've done good mold prep, now we're going to talk about the actual process of shaping the plastic. There are a number of different plastic products on the market in no particular order. Kydex, Bolteron, Holstex are the most commonly used ones. There are several grades of Kydex that are used, Kydex T, Kydex 100. There are a couple different grades of Bolteron that are used, 4335 and 4332 are the most common. 4332 is what's most recommended by Bolteron for holster and sheath applications. Uh, I've also seen 4330 used in years past, but not common anymore. Um, Holstex, as far as I know, there's only one grade of Holstex. But the ability to mold the plastic depends on how you're actually going to apply pressure to it to shape it, and also the temperature at which you're going to shape the plastic. Because Theochromocytoma. I don't know what that is, Luke Trout. You win for the $10 word of the evening. Rusty's Custom Codex is here. Hello, Rusty McKnight. Please like and share the feed. Um, the plastic we're working with is reasonably flexible at room temperature, and your ability to shape it will depend on how soft you get it, which is directly affected by the temperature you heat to. So generally, the best temperature to heat to is as soft as possible without wrecking the plastic. Okay? We're trying to get as much uh, flexibility and elasticity out of the material as we can without overheating it to the point where you either get pock marks in it because it starts to off gas and you're actually like starting to melt the material or scorching or marks on the inside that are unsightly. Prepping molds while watching tonight says Ben Miller. I'm glad to hear that. Chris Johnson says he's leaving. Well, okay. Thank you for stopping in anyway, Chris. Please do watch it later. Um, so different ways of heating. If you are a hobbyist, you're just getting started, probably the most basic inexpensive option is go to Goodwill and buy a toaster oven. That's what I did when I started my company. I started Henry Holsters with a $6 toaster oven from Goodwill. You'll also want a heat gun because a toaster oven is usually not going to give you consistent enough results and you'll usually have to do a little bit of hand tweaking afterwards. Let me show you two different heat guns. Okay, this is a Wagner one. Okay, it's non adjustable, has a high and low setting. This was like 20 some dollars. I got it at Sears years and years and years ago. Does it work? Yes, but the low setting is too low and the high setting is too high. So, not ideal. But in a pinch, it gets stuff hot. What I very much prefer is something like this. Okay, this is a Dewalt. I've gone through four or five of these. It has adjustable temperature on the back, which is nice, uh, a nice long cord, and you can actually remove this nozzle and put different shapes on. You can put a duckbill on uh, and do different things. Um, I like this. This one also nicely has a little flip-out stand, so if you're working near a table, you can set it up on its back and it stands up, which is nice. Setting a heat gun down and melting something because the nozzle lays down is not so fun. A heat gun is a useful tool, but it shouldn't be your first choice for making the product fit in your formed plastic. If you can prep the mold, the goal is always fitment right off the mold rather than getting kind of close and then having to walk in the fit with a heat gun. So toast oven is a great option. Some guys use uh, a large full-size oven. I don't recommend heating up Codex in your kitchen oven. These kind of plastics and food don't mix that well, so just don't use your wife's kitchen oven. Complete Weapon Solutions is here. Hello, Jeremy Mann. Wagner has a decent one at Home Depot right now, says Ben Miller. So if Wagner has a decent, higher quality, adjustable temp heat gun, that might be an option to consider. Uh, I know some guys were using griddles to heat codex. I know Caleb Dahl from Stature Man did this for years. 
basically a modified George Foreman grill. It can work. Um, you will want to take out the uh, Ripley insert and use a flat one, um, but typically it'll take longer to heat your plastic. The benchmark that's most commonly used today, especially for guys who are vacuum forming, is a heat press, which is uh, usually used in the t-shirt or garment making industry to put uh, decals, transfers, uh, to stick rhinestones on stuff. Uh, the Wagner is digital. Dude, digital is nice. Mine is not digital. Um, so if you are a hobbyist, probably a toaster oven and a heat gun will do you. If you're trying to make any decent volume, I think getting a heat press is one of the best investments you can make because it solves several problems. The first one is you have digital temperature control, which most toaster ovens don't have. Uh, the temperature digital control on a heat press is not uh, fail safe and it's probably not actually accurate but it will tend to be reasonably consistent. When you say, when it says 400, it might not actually be 400, but it's probably not going to vary up and down 100 degrees. Also, with a heat press, when you open it and then close it, your temperature stays relatively constant. With a toaster oven, anything where you're heating a volume of air, you open it and then close it, and you just let room temperature air in, and your temperatures get out of whack, and things have to adjust again. Syndicate concealments here, just like painting a car, says Dan Taylor, prep is 95% of the work. This is when I look at holsters, especially if I can't handle them, um, when I just look at them, you can see holster makers who prep carefully, and you can see guys who don't. And to somebody who has eyes to see it, the careful prep is money. You can tell that they thought through the shape, they thought through the blocking, they thought through the angles, and their finished product looks professional because they planned carefully and prepped thoroughly. Um, so however you're heating, heat press, griddle, toaster oven, whatever, you're going to want to get your plastic up to a temperature where it's supple. If your plastic still has some stiffness to it, it's not ready to form yet. You can still make something out of it, but you're not going to get good detail or a very consistent fit. Um, there are different ways of forming. Forming basically just means finding some way to apply pressure to force the plastic into shape around your mold, whatever your mold is. You can make molds out of wood, make them out of plaster. You can buy blue guns, multi-molds. You can CNC cut molds out of wood or metal or plastic, anything you want. Whatever you're using to shape is your mold and your forming process is making the plastic conform to the shape of your mold. If you want to see beast mode prep, check out Zorn holsters. They're full of lessons. Yeah, I would say Zorn and Vigitac. If you don't know those two guys work, you should definitely check it out because they have some of the cleanest, most well thought out mold prep. Nothing on those holsters is by accident and nothing is adjusted in post. When you look at the holsters, it's all there and it's all crispy from the get go. Uh, yeah, Ryan at Triton does awesome prep work, says Jeff Kwan from LAS Concealment. Interesting. Um, so, if you're a small timer or you're a hobbyist, you're just getting into it, you're probably going to want to work with a foam process. A foam process has a number of significant advantages, and it's how most holster makers started their company, is working with foam, and many companies, even big companies like Blade Tech, still use foam process forming for some products. Yeah, they do, Andy. Their logo molded in is pretty sweet. Advantages of foam. This is the biggest one, I think. It's inexpensive and simple and low, uh, low bar for entry. You don't need to have a lot of fancy equipment. You just need some foam, some wood, and some clamps. Three quarter inch plywood works, okay? So it's inexpensive and simple to start. You can use a whole variety of different sizes and shapes of objects to mold around, and foam will work generally fairly well. You can try different densities of foam. You can mix and match different thicknesses of foam. You can do asymmetrical layers of foam in different parts of the press to get better results. Foam has tons of variability to it. You can do all kinds of interesting things with foam. For uh, higher volume production shops, Foam has disadvantages. It wears out. The level of definition a piece of foam produces changes over time as the foam gets used. It becomes gradually less and less resilient um, and then needs to be replaced periodically. But 
If you're just playing around with Kydex or you have things you make occasionally, uh, foam can work really well for those. Foam is usually more forgiving around the muzzle and any place you have hard vertical surfaces, foam generally produces less tenting than vacuum processes because foam doesn't have as much ability to press in. If you're clamping, you're applying force in a fixed direction. Vacuum is applying force in multiple directions because you have a central vacuum port under your mold and you're pulling all the material around the mold in towards it, which is why you can sometimes suck a plastic edge underneath your mold, which foam will not do. If you put a mold down and you're pressing down on it with foam, the foam will not conform to undercuts in the part. Okay? Um, foam does not require very oversized material. This is another big advantage. You can get finished parts out with less material used per part by going with foam. Hello, Tyson Lamb. Good to finally talk to you today. Thank you for stopping by and watching the feed tonight. Please like it and share it. Um, disadvantages of the foam process. One of the biggest ones is foam has a limited ability to mold deep pockets or very tight or detailed shapes. This is not to say it can't make very presentable detail. It can. Uh, Nick, at, Nick Pratt at North... It's like Northern Illinois sent custom, I forget, Nick, Nick Kydex, uh, does very presentable foam work. Um, Paul Bellevue or Bellevo at BRCK does really, really clean foam work and Zorn holsters. A lot of their stuff is foam prepped. Um, so it's not that it can't make detail, but certain kinds of shapes, if you have inside pockets where you have steep verticals um, or the mold is tall, foam generally won't work as well because you can only compress it so far and then it can't go any farther. And foam has, you're always dealing with a foam of a certain volume and you're compressing your shape into it. And the places that are deepest in the part is where the foam compresses the least. And so that you're gonna hit some point of diminishing returns, no matter how much pressure you apply, you're going to reach the mechanical limitations of what the foam can define. Typically, guys who are doing foam and are doing high definition work with foam, you'll get great detail on the highest surfaces on the mold and the detail gradually decreases as you go deeper onto the mold. So the side of the slide, serrations, those kind of things, great detail. Down by the trigger guard, good detail, a little less detail. And then down off the face of the trigger guard, down by the dust cover, increasingly um, more regularized, less defined shapes as you get further down in the depth of the mold. Other disadvantages of foam molding. Longer cooling time. Foam typically has a pretty high insulation value. And so if you put hot kydex in between a couple inches of high density foam and you compress it in there, the foam insulates it. You can't blow air on it easily and it will take longer for your plastic to cool. This is not a big problem and most shops overcome it by building multiple foam presses so they can afford to leave each press closed up for the amount of time it takes for the plastic to cool. While it's cooling, they're working with some other press. That means having to build and maintain multiple presses, which may or may not be a problem. Sometimes you'll have a small one for mags, a couple of larger ones for guns, and like a small, narrow one for knives. You can build particular presses for specific kinds of parts for maximum efficiency, but having multiple presses means having to have more space. Typically, vacuum formers run, vacuum forming shops run a smaller number of machines and are able to put more work on them because the cooling times are shorter. One of the other big disadvantages of foam is you don't usually have immediate feedback because you're closing up the part and the mold in and you can't see what's happening. One of the things I like the most about membraneless vacuum forming on a swift press or on my side former is that I have instant total feedback. As soon as I apply the vacuum, I either get all the definition I'm looking for or I have a leak and it doesn't seal. Something, something either goes all the way right or it goes wrong and I can instantly tell. With foam, it's kind of discouraging to you know, get your plastic hot, put it over your mold, put it in your foam, close it up, apply the clamps, wait seven or eight minutes, take it out and realize that one of your, one of your plastic edges shifted or got folded under, got wrapped weird and the molding was bad, it took you a long time to wait, you gotta wait for your mold to cool down, you gotta start over again. You didn't have that immediate feedback. 
So I think that's one of the major disadvantages of the molding process for, for foam is you can't immediately see what's happening until it's cooled and you take it out. With vac forming, if I lay a sheet of kydex over a mold on my Swift press and I drop my frame on and I don't instantly get full definition, I know I've got a leak or I'm misaligned and I can quickly pull the frame off, pull the plastic and put it back in the heat press, give it 20 or 30 more seconds and go again. It's a surprise party you may or may not want to attend when I'm molding foam. This is making me want to check Sean's work, says Jeff. Well, do. I mean, check it. I mean, don't be rude about it, but check his work. Um, so delayed feedback for foam is a, is a limitation. Uh, tips. This is an odd one. When I used to do a foam molding process for taco holsters, I would pre-cut my kydex into shape. I would lightly heat it so it was foldable. I would fold it edge to edge, and I would staple my edges. So I had basically an envelope where I had a fold at one edge and staples at the other edge. And then I would put it back in my toaster oven and heat it up, folded, and then just slip the gun in and put it in the press. And that made sure that my pieces didn't shift off or misalign and end up short on one side. It doesn't work well with a heat press because uh, stacking plastic, multiple layers in a heat press doesn't work as well because you have a single-sided heat source. But if you're heating with an oven, you can layer, you can have a folded up piece of plastic and heat it pretty consistently. Uh, it was a useful trick. I don't do it at all anymore, but a full-size a full heavy-duty office stapler will easily staple through two cold sheets of .08. I also used to use it to align the front and back piece of my outside, the waistband holsters. I used to pre-cut the sweat guard um, so I could nest more shapes out of each 2x4 foot piece. And I would line up my front and back piece. I would staple them, two staples per edge and two at the bottom, so that uh, when I put my mold in, the muslin couldn't flare open and then roll under when I formed it. But I don't do any of that anymore. But if you're working with foam, you may want to have an office stapler in the shop. It may allow you to pin some edges or pin corners or prevent the plastic from shifting or rolling under. Uh, oh, heat press, I forgot to mention, one of the other big advantages is because your sheet of plastic is under pressure when it's being heated, you don't get the, pl the classic curling up, you know, plastic turning into a fruit roll up, which a lot of guys used to complain a lot about for Bolteron, that it was more likely to curl up than Kydex was. In a heat press, it's a non-issue. It can't curl anywhere. Uh, vacuum. There are two kinds of vacuum. You can obviously do membrane forming or non-membrane forming. If you don't know what those are, go back and watch some of my earlier videos about like the thrift press and, and that kind of stuff. Um, vacuum can achieve great definition. It is less forgiving because it achieves greater definition. And so any mistakes you make in the mold prep really translate through more clearly in a vacuum forming process. So if you're a musician, it's like plugging a really great guitar into a phenomenal amp, okay? Or picking up a really good violin for a really good horn. Every little thing that used to get kind of washed out now shows up. And so if your mold prep is great, vacuum forming reveals that. And if your mold prep is lousy, vacuum forming reveals that. What's your preferred time and temp for 0.08 kydex in a heat press? Art, I use almost exclusively Bolteron. My preferred time and temperature right now is around 380 for a minute 35 or a minute 40. I have significantly increased the pressure of my heat press lately and found that that allowed me to shave a little bit of temperature and a little bit of time off my recipe. Generally, uh, if you use an IR thermometer, to check the actual temperature of your plastic when you finish your heating cycle, I would say shoot for having your plastic in the 350 to 370 range is a good safe place to mold with good definition without getting so hot that you scorch. I know some guys really, really like to push the temps and have their heat presses running up over 400. I don't like that as much. It's not the way I like to work my plastic. Uh, ben, I use 4332 almost exclusively. I use very little 4335 in my shop. Um, I like 4332, and I buy it in bulk. 
Uh, vacuum has shorter cooling times. Membraneless, Swift Press style, where you can put a fan and blow directly on the Kydex or on the plastic, has the shortest possible cooling cycles. Any kind of uh, vacuum forming with a membrane, okay, um, like a silicone membrane like this, you'll usually get slightly less definition and slightly longer cooling times in a membrane vacuum former, but the trade-off is you can use smaller pieces of plastic, so you may find for you that equation works out better. Uh, John says mold durability and mold maintenance. Yes, vacuum forming is much harder on molds because the more you pull the plastic tightly onto the mold, the more likely you are to break, chip, or wear the mold when you're demolding. Be careful heating carbon fiber though. Yeah, the carbon fiber ones, anything that has an actual surface texture on it, they're a little more sensitive to heat. You can sort of smush the texture out. So, you know, always use, cut some small pieces and test. Okay, I don't ever, I don't ever put a big piece of expensive material I haven't worked with before in the press. I'll always test some small pieces first because I want real feedback from my heater my vacuum former, I want to see what this plastic actually does. So I'm not going to throw the biggest possible piece in. I'm going to start with small pieces and mold some small shapes and just see what happens. Um, vacuum forming gives you instant feedback. When you go to mold, you can see the plastic taking shape in real time. It's all visible. Okay? So e even if you're looking at it through a membrane, you can see clearly and you can gauge by eye whether or not you achieve the definition you want and whether the critical areas on your mold that are going to determine whether it fits or not have actually formed well. So uh, here's a shell I vacuum formed. Uh, this is Bolteron 4332. It was pulled on an HDPE mold in my Swift Press. Uh, this is the Inforce uh, APLC. Um, you can see I've got nice crisp definition around all these verticals. They're very tight. And I've got good corners in my site channel and nice clean lines around my molded in wedge. Okay? If my plastic was not up to full temperature, even though the mold has those shapes built in, they will not be captured in the molding process. So uh, for guys who are starting off, who are beginners, um, you don't have to worry about chasing maximum definition. Good enough is good enough. If the part you molded fits, if you're a leather man or you're a fixed blade or you know whatever gun you're molding for, if it fits and it's held securely and doesn't rattle around or fall out, you're good. Okay? You will gradually, as you do it more and more often, get an intuitive feel for the material. When you handle it out of the heater, you will know whether it's hot enough. Any chance the Swifts will be coming back? Mike Holmes, yes, Swifts are coming back. I've been getting more inquiries about it recently. Uh, since I'd put out a lot of information about how to build your own thrift press, I had not been in a big rush uh, to make another big batch of Swift presses. But yes, I have a bunch of material. I will be making a new batch. I have a few other projects that are more pressing than that, so it's going to be a few weeks at least. But I do plan to make some more Swift presses. That product is not dead by any means. Uh, here is a folded up uh, shell made from the same mold, my APLC appendix. Okay. And you can see that I've cut away this entire vertical face. If I had tenting out here, if I had the plastic folding or bunching up at these corners, it wouldn't really matter if it were out here because I'm cutting it off. And so I generally try to extend my mold so that any extra material, any slack, piles up in places that are going to get chucked that are not in the finished part. So Glock 19. Blade Tech training barrel, so I know it's clear. Uh, APLC. I don't know if you guys can hear that. It's a funny little light. It doesn't have a lot of contours to mold on. Um, but yeah, I like it. Uh, this is just a, a shell, no guts. So I haven't had a chance to actually try the light out. Um, like a lot of you, probably, I've got one on order from Optics Planet, and who knows when they're actually going to have them in stock. Um, so, tenting. The slack has to go somewhere. When you're molding, the material has to go somewhere and you need to figure out ways to move it either to places where it has a more gradual shape to conform to and so won't pile up or fold up 
or you've got to shift it outside the boundaries of your part and cut it away. To do that, usually you'll extend the blocking. Classic example is the muzzle. Guys would put blocking out in front of their muzzle so the plastic would dive partially down off the muzzle and then continue straight out and then dive again. If you let the plastic go over those contour changes gradually, you will reduce tenting. And this is true in a foam process. This is true in membrane vac forming and non-membrane vac forming. Okay? Careful blocking can reduce or relocate tenting and folding problems into areas that are no longer a problem for you. Uh, another thing with vac forming, the taller your mold is, especially in vac forming, the taller your mold is, the more you will have issues with the plastic bunching up, especially at corners. Uh, I was working on a tourniquet carrier recently, pretty tall mold, and uh, man, tons of tenting. And the way I solved it was by lengthening the mold so that that tenting and wrapping at those corners, even if it came back onto the side face, which was a, a finish, a keep face, uh, I still had a quarter inch of dead space at the end of that ledge where I could just trim off the whole end cap of the Kydex with all the folds and everything and just not have to worry about it and get a clean shape. Christopher Jason is winking at me. That's right, dude. You got to work the process when you're dealing with the cool C&G Arms tourniquet carrier. So, if you are a person who does molding in your shop, say you're an employee and you work in a shop where tasks are divided up and you're a guy who's responsible for molding, um, you more than almost anybody else in the entire shop are responsible for the final fit and function of the product. Because if the molding is done really well and the molds are prepped well, all the other stuff after that becomes easier and the end product will fit better. If guys after you are having to adjust and tweak, um, you should try to eliminate those problems up front by adjusting your molds. Anytime I'm not happy with the fit, I always want to go back and adjust the mold because if I can fix the mold, I can achieve the result I want consistently. Anytime I have to hand modify, heat gun, adjust, even if I've got retention screws and I'm just adjusting, anytime I have to do something variable later in the process to compensate or you know, correct the fit, I'm never going to be able to get that as consistently as if I built the fix into the mold and then simply copied it into every plastic part. I just produced a replica of the fix every time I mold a part. So molded in solutions are the best solutions. Um, if you're struggling with getting uh, poor definition, poor molding results because you have variability in your temperature process, maybe you bought the cheap toaster oven and it was fine starting out but you're starting to make more holsters and it's not keeping up or its thermostat is really loose and you fluctuate 40 or 50 degrees. Um, if you're using an oven, don't trust the thermostat on the oven always verify with an IR thermometer, just crack the door open and actually uh, gun the plastic and see what its real temperature is. But you should be able to tell when you handle the plastic to take it from your heat source to your molding area, you should be able to tell the feel of it in your hands should let you know whether it's at an acceptable temperature. And guys, when you move from heat to molding, go as fast as possible. It doesn't matter how perfect your heat temperature recipe is, if you take too long moving the plastic, you will lose that optimal formability window of temperature for the plastic. You start cooling the instant you stop heating. As soon as you pop open the heat press, you're cooling. As soon as you grab the plastic and start moving it through room temperature air, you're cooling. As soon as it comes into contact with a room temperature mold, it's cooling. Get it formed as quickly as you can. Okay? And that's not just because you'll get the best results, but you'll get the most consistent results because there's going to be an upper limit on how fast you can move. Okay? You want your heat source and your molding area to be so close that there are zero footsteps involved. Okay? Zero footsteps. 
you want to be able to stand in one place, plastic folding area or molding area. You don't want to have to be walking around a table or walking even down a table or down a bench. You don't want to have to be turning all the way around 180. You want your stuff, I like my stuff in an L orientation side by side. So I'm standing facing my press, plastic molded, plastic molded, no moving around, no wasted time, no wasted movement, just right there. Um, and John points out that the thinner your plastic is, the faster you will lose that temperature because it's a function of the surface area versus the mass. Um, so yeah, the thinner your plastic, the faster it will cool. Uh, do, 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 do. I talked about vacuum forming being less forgiving, but it also gives instant feedback. I've covered most of the things in my molds. What are your questions? Specifically, if you are new to Kydex or don't have a lot of experience as a holster maker, I especially want you to take this opportunity to ask me some questions about whatever you have questions about related to molding stuff. Uh, so I'm going to take a second and look around and see if there was anything else, any other props I put out that I wanted to show you guys. I showed you the heat guns, showed you the APLC shell. Do, 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 do. Not sure if comments seem to have frozen up a couple of times through the feed. They seem to be back now. Brent Fernandez says Swift Press for life. Do, 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 do. Going back to comments. Durability. Black Sheep Tactical. Hello, Ruben. No, I'm really late on greeting you. Um, man, good turnout tonight. Thank you guys all for coming. Uh, if you're here watching and you haven't already liked and shared the feed, please do like and share the feed. I especially look forward to the chance to speak to guys and share this info with guys who have not previously seen my stuff and maybe don't follow me on Instagram or Facebook. And so, uh, like my organizing skills today. Yeah, I don't know if you guys saw, I put up some short videos. Uh, on Instagram showing some of the particular changes that I made in the shop to the drill press area, to our mold press area, prep area, to the strip heater area. Uh, I added a little tape measure on a little shelf over here by my mill right here. I'm always reaching for a tape and it's almost always on the table behind me. So now it's right next to me, next to the door. What amount of draft do you recommend for HDPE molds? Good question. Good question. Um, on HDPE molds, I generally don't put in draft angles, and there are two reasons. Um, first, HDPE especially is pretty pretty slick. The plastic does not bite onto it very very uh, very hard. It's a smooth surface, so I find HDPE to demold pretty easily. Draft angles become more and more critical when you're dealing with taller parts, and when you're dealing with things that have uh, contours and complicated edges. Jeff Kwan asks, heat press recommendations larger than 21 inch. Jeff, I don't know anything about heat presses that size. I use a 16 by 20. Um, I wanted a good quality American made press. I decided I didn't want to buy a big Chinese one, but I also skipped over the large heat press phase and went straight from Swift Press to a large dual station industrial former, which has major pros and major cons. Um, so, uh, but back to the question about draft angles. Generally, on most of our split molds, I put draft angles on the outside edge of the base, but I don't put draft angles on the side of the gun uh, or the sides of the slide because generally those contours are shallow enough that it's not that big an issue. But places where it would come into play, um, if I had a gun, you know, I had a split mold and I had a mold base under it at the back of the slide where the thickness of the mold is all the way from the bottom of the mold base to the top of the slide, I'll always draft angle that back and I usually put a five degree angle on there. I actually got myself some tapered cutters. Um, it's basically just a somewhere I have it, a big end mill, yeah, this guy. This is a five degree per side tapered three flute carbide end mill. Um, 
This is a 5 8 inch shank, so you got to have a pretty good size tool, a pretty good size machine to run it. Uh, Jeff, the reason I decided not to go with a large Chinese one um, is not because I have any problem with buying tools from China in general, but because I wanted to make sure if I bought a machine that size that I'd be able to get replacement parts and get prompt and well-informed service and support. And you just don't. When you buy overseas from a, from a company, the ability to give you service and support is less. I, when I, I bought mine from Geonite. I have a K20, which I love. It's a 16 by 20 press. Um, you know, the size of the press is partly related to the, to the size of your molds. Uh, if my molds were five inches wide, the difference between having uh, the ability to, eat, to heat a 12 inch wide piece or a 14 inch wide piece wouldn't matter. Um, on a swift press, I usually at most do four holsters at a time. I don't have a heat source or a press big enough to do six or eight. And so I'm just not, I'm just not too concerned about it. Um, guys who are doing hybrids, like Spider Consumers got a big heat press and they built themselves a big swift press. Um, uh, Scott, the reason I'm able to give good retention is because my uh, wedge has no impact. No part of my wedge has anything to do with the trigger guard. On my appendix holsters, I fully form the trigger guard on both sides. The wedge is behind the slide, not behind the trigger guard. You may be thinking of somebody else's rig, but I fully mold the trigger guard on both sides. Um, I bought a Geonite, and the 16 by 20 size works really well for me. Um, any project for me that's high enough volume that I can't keep up, or my employee Eric can't keep up with a Swift press, um, is something that I switch onto the big former. But you know, if it's less than 100 units at a time, we just Swift press it. It's faster. So, I mean, on this shell. Scott, you can see the wedges next to the slide and a little bit on the dust cover, but there's no trigger guard here because this is light bearing. Um, tighter coils is better, says a mod. That was one of the things that really sold me on the Geonite press was a very, very tight grid of heater coils. Um, I had a couple of the Power Press brand 16 by 24 presses off Amazon. Uh, one of them died just after the warranty period went out, which was a bummer. I had to eat that. Um, but their heater elements are few and far between. Think like oven element, like one big loop with a large dead space in the center. And I found that I was often getting scorching out near my edges and some of my centers were still under temp, which for me was unacceptable. Uh, so the, the uh, is it a DK or a GK? K20, the 16 by 20 inch manual press from Geonite is what I have. I love it. Um, I think... I'm not convinced that going big is necessarily that much faster. Um, it seems like there's more, you know, the, the more molds you wrap up into the sheet of plastic, the more time you eat up handling the plastic and demolding all the plastic. I would rather, um, what I typically do on my small press is, if I'm making Glock 19 holsters, I'll have six copies of the mold and I'll be pulling them on the former as fast as I can heat the plastic. So I'll put my first piece in, two molds on the former. Plastic is hot, vacuum it. While it's cooling, next piece of plastic is in and heating. When that's cool, I take it off, two more molds go on while those first ones continue cooling. Plastic is hot, throw it on, vacuum it, fresh piece in the heater, close it up. While these ones are cooling and those ones finish cooling, I swap those, I pop the first set out, I put the third set on, I pull plastic, and I've just got this rotating thing going. So the heat press is constantly heating and the swift press is constantly forming. And I'm able to keep that workflow going and produce a lot of parts without having to go really big and have it be awkward. Um, so I'm not convinced that the time savings are really that huge by going bigger. Is there an intermediate step between the 250 and the Geonite? Dan Taylor, desirable height for the wedge, 
just find what works for you. Um, I mold the wedge differently depending on the overall size and shape of the particular um, particular gun and light combo I'm working with. Like my my 300 Ultra rig has a more pronounced wedge because I'm trying to rotate a bigger package. Um, this is an important thing. If you are not a solo shop, if you have more than one person, two slow machines beat a super fast machine, almost always. This is why a lot of machine shops will, instead of having one really, really fast machine and doing all their work on it and constantly changing the fixtures, it'll actually be faster for them to buy two less expensive, slower machines, put them side by side, and have the first operation face up on this machine, take it to the second machine and flip it over, and have two spindles going at once. That's almost always going to be faster than one spindle, no matter how fast it goes. So like if you're trimming parts or you're using a CNC, okay, a lot of guys think, oh, I'm going to get a 4x4, four four, or I'm going to get a 4x8. It's going to be so efficient. Actually, it's not. You would be able to do more work with two 2x2 two two foot CNCs than you would with one 4x8 foot CNC. Two spindles is always better than one. Uh, if you have an employee and the two of you can mold, if you work on more of a pallet based approach where you've got multiple copies of the mold and you're cycling them through the former as quickly as possible, the two of you running identical side by side cells, heat press, former, cooling fans, will put out tremendous quantities of parts. Um, whereas if you have a big heat press and you have to take time to get all nine molds out and then put them back on and line them back up, um, you're going to have, you'll get more parts per cycle, but you'll have more downtime between cycles. CNC recommendations so I can buy two. I think probably for CNC routers, Cam Master is the way to go these days. I know a lot of guys have gotten burned by Shop Saber. Um, so I wouldn't buy Shop Saber. There are a few other budget options like Velox CNC, but I wouldn't go with them. I'd probably just go Cam Master. I only have one, says Andy, and it makes me nervous. Only one what? Only one CNC? Only one forming setup? What? Um, the other big advantage of a smaller, more pallet based um, continuous operation is really the goal. If you're forming, you want that process to flow and keep moving and keep moving. So if you had a large heat press and a large former and anything went wrong, you had a leak, you tore a hole in the plastic, you didn't line it up properly, you lose more time and more material for every failure. And if you have a big, if you have a big swift press and a big t-shirt press and your heat press dies, you've got nothing. You're stuck. If you have two smaller systems running side by side and one of them dies, you can still run the other one and keep it going. So I'm in favor of more cellular work, trying to go for a more continuous process rather than going bigger. That makes sense. Uh, other questions, let me scroll back and see if I missed any questions and I'm going to go finish my dinner. I need to make more molds. I was thinking so I can use a fully inf a full infused sheet instead of cutting it every time. Uh, Andy asks, is there an intermediate step between a 250 Chinese and a Geonite? Yeah, there are some presses that are in the probably six, seven hundred dollar range that are a good intermediate. I think Todd May uses one of those, uh, an M press, something like that. I didn't shop um, for that intermediate range much. Once I got done with the power press ones, I was looking for a premium heat press. Uh, so I went straight to the top. I think my Geo Knight was about 1200 bucks, um, And it's been great. I'd buy it again in a heartbeat. Other questions? Uh, when you're dealing with more expensive or infused or printed plastics, then you're going to want to try to find the sweet spot between getting the maximum yield out of the plastic, uh, obviously because it's expensive material. But going bigger is not necessarily always the best answer. Uh, if you're dealing with one by twos, then 
uh, yeah, okay? Depending on how you orient your parts and the size of your parts, getting a 16 by 24 so you can heat the full 24 may be critical for you. I found on my 16 by 24 that the last two inches at each end were kind of inconsistent. And so even though it was 16 by 24, it didn't give me an effective 24. Whereas my 16 by 20, because its heater array is dense, gives me a pretty effective 16 by 20. So you'll have, to, you'll have to figure that one out and test it out and see what happens. Hey, Ryan, late to the party, but not too li late to like and share the feed. I've already finished going through all my notes, and there was no giveaway tonight because Chris Johnson showed up. So I hid all the goodies and didn't give anything away. Cause... That's the issue with the M press, says Ahmad. Cooler ends. That's something you'll have to check with any heat press you use. And the only effective way to really check that, you can, you can IR thermometer the actual platen, but you'll also want to put in a full size or even an over full size sheet and heat it and then pull it out and check it. You can flatten that sheet and reheat it and use it as your temperature check sheet. Uh, I often use scraps and you can use um, they don't have to be beautifully sized, they can have wavy edges, and you can reheat them. Just to, you know, I have scrap pieces that I use whenever I'm adjusting the pressure. I don't throw a fresh piece in there and, you know, because when I'm adjusting the pressure, I'm going to open it up and adjust and close, and then open it and adjust and close. I just throw in some scrap, small pieces, four or five of them, to simulate a full-size piece, so I'm getting an even, uh, even coverage when I close the press. And then just mess around with it until the tension's adjusted the way I want, and then pull those ones out, put a you know, put something on them to keep them flat, let them cool down, and save them for later. Guessing, uh, guess I'm buying a Geonite and two Stinger ones. I would say that's probably not a bad way to go, Jeff. If you can keep those machines busy, you will make a ridiculous amount of parts with them. Um, if I was only trimming holsters, I would not buy this machine. I would probably buy a Stinger at this point. Um, because, you know, trimming holsters generally can be done with a single tool. You don't need a tool changer to trim holsters. And you don't need ridiculously high speeds. Um, if I were trimming on a stinger, what I would do with my trim fixtures is I would, um, say I was making Glock 19 holsters. I say this often. Say I was making Glock 19 holsters because I do that all the time. Um, I would try to set up two identical trim stations side by side on the machine and give them separate work coordinates, G54, G55, et cetera, so that I can bolt the first part down, trim it while it's trimming, and you'll need a dust cover or some kind of protective hood so you're not near and getting pelted with chips. I could be putting a part on the second fixture and fastening it down, and then when... The first one finishes, I run another program that cuts at the second fixture, then I vacuum off and clean off and remove the parts from the first one, and I have the spindle cutting basically continuously. You want to try to change parts and reload the machine while the machine is running whenever possible. If you do that with a pallet system, so you have one cutting station, but you have a separate pallet that you're load and unload, and then you just swap pallets and start the machine again. That's a very efficient way. Side-by-side -side stations with a router where there's no full enclosure and you have access to the table is a very effective way to allow you to fixture parts while you're cutting at the other station. In my mill, because of the safeties, I can't, and the table moves, uh, I can't be fixturing and working on the table while the head's cutting. Totally unsafe and the machine safeties would shut it off. But on a router where the table is fixed and you have more surface area and you can have the router cutting in one place and be fixturing in another, that's a really efficient way to do it if you can do it. Um, but uh, every shop has to figure out how the workflow works best for them. Generally, smaller, more efficient machines that are running continuously are going to be a better option, in my opinion, and for my shop than bigger machines that run intermittently. So we've gotten a little bit off the topic of molding. I'm about to close it down. If you have any other questions about molding, go ahead and throw them in here real quick. I'm going to drink a little more water and then call it a night.
Thank you guys for stopping by and watching. I appreciate all of you spending your evening with me. Thank you for liking and sharing the feed. Um, I will probably be doing one more Facebook Live later this week. Um, kind of a busy weekend for me. I got some fundraising stuff to do for my kids' school. Um, so I'll be out of the shop a bit. And uh, yeah, working on some fun new things. The APLC mold's been turning out great. I've started sending those out to my customers uh, for, for mold checking. And uh, hopefully the APLC will actually be on the market soon. Hey, Mike Hallam just got here. Mike, share the feed. I'm on the way out the door, but still share the feed. Um, good night, Will. Good night, Seth Thomas. Thank you, guys. Have a great night. Uh, and as always, if you have particular topics you want me to cover, uh, shoot me a DM or an email or send me a text and let me know what you would like to see covered so that I can do my best to give you info that's relevant to you with whatever it is you're currently working on. Thanks, guys. Have a great night.